right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Let me call this case and then I'll have an inquiry for Madam Clerk. We're taking up CR 2020-8457. It's State of Idaho versus Jenna Nicole Holm, and we're joined in the courtroom with Council Crane and Wixom, and Mr. Neal is here on behalf of uh, the state. Let me just verify with Madam Clerk. I know we're um, utilizing various modes of technology today. We're operating to some degree over Zoom. <coughs> is that prepared and functional? Okay. And we have our court reporter that has already checked in with us. And we'll be making a, a record with regards to uh, our proceedings today. Just as a note uh, for this particular proceeding, uh, as the parties know, and I'll just recite for the record, this court has scheduled trial for Monday, and yesterday the court had uh, motions that had been filed to be heard in the afternoon, a motion filed by the defense to dismiss, and the plaintiff's motion to continue. At that time, the court understood that the parties had reached an agreement and the court has been provided a motion in order to amend uh, the complaint. And uh, I think those were submitted through Odyssey and I have those. I'll sign those at the appropriate time. Just want to verify that that's everyone's understanding of what brings us here to the court today. Yes, Your Honor. It is, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. And so, um, at this point, why don't I invite one of the parties, whether it's the state or the defense, to set forth uh, any terms of an agreement that you would like to place on the record, and I'll have some inquiry following that. Thank you, Judge. Uh, the state is moving to amend the current charge, which is aggravated assault, to uh, the exhibition of a deadly weapon, uh, count one, and resisting or obstructing officers count to and that's that's the extent of what will happen today okay are there any uh, terms by way of an agreement that should be set forth on the record not for today all right um, are there going to be sentencing recommendations that uh, each party will make in terms of the amended charges uh, there's no recommendations, uh, obviously, because of the amendment that will affect the extent of the possible possible penalties. Um, we'll argue for the maximum on these, but uh, due to the nature of our prior incarceration, I believe that we're, we're looking at those have already been fulfilled. Okay. And so the attorneys are aware the court would be inviting comments following um, any potential victim impact statements for at least statements regarding the sentence and what is available. I have the motion to amend before me and the court uh, understands the parameters of the, that the court has for sentence, but I'll still invite comment and hope that the parties will be willing to make statements regarding uh, the respective positions. No, we need to make one point. Okay, okay. So Judge, I, I agree with what the state has uh, said about resolution today um, even if they argue for the max I, I want to be clear that we'll follow this up with a file for agreement we're in the process of doing that but the whatever the recommendation is the agreement is that she will not uh, receive any additional jail time to serve that she'll get credit towards any sentence from the time that she's already served uh, and, and no time imposed or suspended that's our understanding okay so thank you and you will submit a written plea agreement that will follow up with these terms all right, and so um, let's walk our way then through the actual change of plea. And is it the party's understanding that that will be handled today along with the sentence? Correct. It is, yes. Okay, and likewise, as would be a common occurrence, the court, uh, given the nature of the amendments, would remand this matter uh, for magistrate court. However, I understand that the parties expect this court to pronounce the sentence. And um, we 
would just make the additional comment that having presided over this case through its duration, it makes sense for this court to do just that for now sentence. And, uh, given the age of the case and the history involved, I'm willing to uh, accept that request to step in the shoes of a magistrate and follow uh, the sentence. So, and a plea in the magistrate arena, um, as is common in the seventh judicial district, is a little bit different looking than in the district court. In terms of the plea, my uh, request was to ensure through counsel and, and the client that there is a factual basis for the plea. So I'll direct my attention to the defense through counsel and Ms. Holm directly. Is it your understanding, ma'am, that the uh, agreement that has been struck between the parties is as described by, both by your counsel and the little information that you've heard thus far for today? Does counsel concur subject to that written plea agreement? Yes, sir. Okay. And ma'am, do you feel like you've had enough time to consult with your attorneys about this decision? Yes. And do you feel like you've had uh, at, at your uh, disposal and review all of the discovery of the case? Yes. Is there anything that you feel that hasn't been done on your behalf that would need to be accomplished before today? Do you have any questions for your attorney or for the court before this takes place? I don't. Do you feel pressured or coerced in any way to this plea? No. Has anyone intimidated or threatened you? No. Would it be proper for this? I'm sorry to interrupt, Judge. I just need the defendant to speak a little bit louder. Okay, thank you. And if counsel can help as each of you are speaking, perhaps uh, manipulate the microphone to each that's speaking. All right, so, um, and do you feel like there has been uh, any reward offered for you to plead guilty? No. And do you think it would be fair for this court to conclude that you're pleading guilty under your own free will and choice? Yes. Okay. And today, do you feel clear-minded? Yes. You're not under the influence today of any alcohol, drugs, or controlled substances? No. Okay. And has your counsel gone over with you the potential punishments associated with these offenses? Um, not necessarily. We just discussed that the time that I've done would be enough. Okay. So as this court understands, and please counsel correct me if, if I am wrong, the maximum sentence available under what would be count one, exhibition of a deadly weapon, is... Uh, up to six months of local incarceration and a $500 fine. And the resisting and obstructing an arrest is a maximum of one year and a $1,000 fine. Okay. I'll have a question for counsel regarding uh, reimbursement of services of the public defender in just a, a moment. But is that your understanding of the maximum penalties associated with these offenses? Yes. Thank you. Um, any questions? No. Okay, and uh, to counsel before I get her plea directly, do you believe that there are factual bases for each of these pleas? We do, Your Honor. Okay, very well. Then, ma'am, how do you plead to the amended charges of exhibition of a deadly weapon and resisting and obstructing arrest? I plead guilty. Very good. And the, the court accepts that guilty plea consistent with your statement and counsel's statement that there is a factual basis for the plea. Would the state have any further inquiry uh, from the court to the, to the defendant regarding the plea itself? No, yeah. Okay, thank you. So I will direct Madam Clerk to enter on the record a guilty plea to those two amended offenses. And as I said earlier, this court will be the one presiding over sentence, and I think it's understood that that will take place at this time. Are there going to be any uh, victim impact statements? Yes, Your Honor. All right, so my instruction with regards to the victim impact statement, are they here in person? We have uh, one written statement that will be read. Okay. We have a, uh, the father, Chris uh, Mazur, is on Zoom. Um, and then um, uh, Paige 
each Mazer would would be here in person. Okay. Is that the order that you would like to take them up? Yes. All right. And my direction to the media that's here today is to refrain from uh, capturing the images of the victim uh, and those making those statements. Do I have your commitment that that will be honored? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. All right. Then, Council, if you'll. And as I understand it, I, I would make this inquiry to counsel. There is no objection to these three individuals making statements. Judge, we're just different in the court. Okay. Um, thank you. I would be inclined to permit this, given what I characterize as a, an agreement between the parties. The court has looked at the victim's rights statute and understand that there are definitions associated with that, and we would apply those to these two counts. Uh, there has been discussion, obviously, and an agreement between the parties. And so, and, unless there's an affirmative objection, my inclination would be to permit these uh, individuals to make their statements. Your Honor, uh, we'd ask Jessica Wilharm to be allowed. Yeah, she's a legal assistant with our office to be able to read the uh, statement from Wyatt's uh, mother. Has the statement been provided to the defense? It has not. Okay. Um, before we proceed, and I, I, I note that counsel is conferring for just a moment. Um, again, is the defense comfortable in allowing these three witnesses? Would you like to see the statement? I know you wouldn't be able to with the other two because those will, as I understand, not be written. Judge, I think perhaps best way to frame this is we're not going to object. I think we're, we're anticipating statements. Um, there, there could be potential implications outside of this litigation. And so, you know, we've not agreed to it. We're not objecting to it. We're referring to the court's rulings. That's sort of all we have to say. Very well. Thank you. All right, ma'am. If you'll uh, come forward and pull that microphone, if it's more comfortable, go ahead and have a seat. And if, if the remarks have an introduction then you may begin if there isn't then counsel you can share who's the author of the statement this is sandy arnold and she's deputy quiet mazer's mother thank you dear jenna i say here writing this letter with the greatest hole in my heart and soul that a mother could ever have the choices you made May 18th, 2020, resulted in the death of my beautiful son, Wyatt Mazur. You have destroyed our family and taken the most caring, selfless soul this world ever knew. His daughter will never know her father. She will never get to go to father-daughter dances, have him teach her to ride a bike or to drive, she will not have him to walk her down the aisle at her wedding. She was just eight months old when, she, when he died. She does not have any of her own memories of her father. All she will ever have is the photos, videos, and stories of others. She has been robbed of a father by you and by your choices. His wife lost her husband and best friend her one true partner, the person she could lean on the most. She became a widow and a single mother because of you and your choices that night. I watched her struggle and fight to figure out how to live without Wyatt. She does not get to grow old with Wyatt, have more children with Wyatt, or watch grandchildren with Wyatt. Again, because of you and your choices, as for me, your choices took my son, half my heart and soul. You have robbed me from watching my son be the incredible father he was. I do not get to see him play with his daughter. I have, tried, I have to try to explain to a three-year-old that her father is in heaven instead of here on earth where he should be, all because of you and your choices. I am appalled that you have not taken one bit of responsibility for his death. Your actions caused this whole event to happen. All you have done is worried about you and what you can get for yourself. Never once have you asked about our family and how we are coping. Never once have you said 
you were sorry for the choices you made that night. I know your child passed away, and for that I am truly sorry. But at least you got to be with him in his last minutes to say goodbye. Our family was not afforded a goodbye because of you and your choices. For the last two and a half years, I have tried to learn to live without my child, and I still have no idea how. I do blame you for his death because you are responsible. I refuse to hate you because I will not let you have that power over me. I have, however, will never forgive you for what you have done. I do not want to hear about your addiction or your mental health problems because you have choices. You have a choice to treat both of them and do the right thing, but you have always chosen to do wrong. You have terrorized my family with what you have done, and I do not believe that you were sentenced to what you deserve to be sentenced to today. You get out of jail and get to leave this community, but I hope for you, I hope for what you have done, why, why its face crosses your mind every day. I hope every one of those thoughts is painful and reminds you, Jenna Holm, you are responsible for the death of Deputy Wyatt Mazur. This is Judge Watkins, and I'll just check to make sure you can hear me. Yes, I can. And we can you as well. And so now I would invite you to make your statement. Good morning, May 18th, 2020. Forever, forever haunt me and my family. From the first call that morning that Wyatt had been in an accident to the heartbreaking call that his wife Paige was forced to make to tell me that my beautiful son was no longer with us. At the time we did not know what had taken place, just that now and forever we would all be forced to go on living with a gigantic hole in our lives. That all the plans, hopes and dreams that Wyatt and Paige had for their lives were no more. That his nine-month-old baby girl, whose pride and joy, would never know her daddy. That we, as parents, would never again hear him say, I love you. We don't get to watch him be a father, a husband, or a brother. We don't get to pick up the phone and talk. We just, just have his memory, because we miss him every day, every holiday. While well, it was truly one of a kind, he always wanted to help and he always wanted to do the right thing. He was proud of what he was doing, and he was doing it for the right reasons. It was to help people. There was proof of that in how he handled himself and the self-control he showed that early morning hours. And that is the reason that you, Jenna, are alive. It was because he did have that, and he was doing it for the right reasons. He recognized who you were and the issues you had. You were the catalyst to his death, though, because of your decisions. Your addictions, they put him in that place at that time because you have refused to change yourself your entire life. You have no idea what your actions have caused this family. And you have taken zero responsibility for your actions, and it is heartbreaking. You and your attorneys have drugged this out for over two years. That has just caused more pain and frustration for everyone in our family. And you show no remorse. Even when you were bailed out of jail, you showed no remorse as you went back to using drugs again instead of changing your life for the better of getting the help that you need. And I truly pray that you and your actions do not hurt anyone else. 
Quiet had a belief that officers of the law should be held to a higher standard. He said that if I'm going to uphold the law, I need to follow it. I just hope that someday Sergeant Randy Flagle will be held to account for his part in Wyatt's death as well. I have no idea why this has not been done. If Wyatt were a civilian, would he be held to account? If it was a civilian that hit him, would they have been held to account? All questions that no one seems to want to answer, and I don't know why. Why are you out living your life with no consequences for your negligent actions when we have to live every day with the pain of losing Wyatt? You will never understand how we feel. We haven't even heard it, I'm sorry. But I pray that God gives his family strength to continue through life without Wyatt the best way we can. And I pray that God gives all of you strength to choose to do the right thing, even though it will be hard. And I pray the name that Wyatt Christopher Maser is forever remembered by all. Thank you. Thank you. May 18, 2020 was the worst day of my life. I woke up to a knock on my front door that no one should ever have to get. And I was the sheriff's deputy telling me my husband had been in an accident. After waiting months to find out the details of what actually happened that night after the investigation was released, I have come to direct my blame at three people. Jenna Holm is one of those people. If Miss Holm had chosen not to partake in illegal drugs that morning, my husband would still be alive. If she had chosen to listen to the commands of law enforcement officers that morning, my husband would still be alive. There were many other mistakes made that day, and so far, Miss Holm has taken responsibility for none of them. It makes me sick. White Knight's daughter was nine months old when he was killed. She will only be able to know who he was through pictures and the memories that I and others have. And now when she asks me what happened to her daddy, I have to say that absolutely no one was held responsible and that there was no justice served to honor White's memory. To have this drug out over two years has been absolutely excruciating. The only thing Ms. Holm has lost is a small amount of her personal freedom. I have lost my partner, the father of my child, my support system, and a piece of my heart that I will never get back. Not only that, but I lost our future together and being able to see him be a father to my daughter. Wyatt was an amazing father. He missed our daughter's first steps her first birthday, and so much more. This is not closure. Getting two misdemeanors and time served is in no way capable of counting for the part that this home played in my husband's death. And having the actual person that killed my husband, Sergeant Flagle, not have a single repercussion and still be able to put on the same uniform that my husband is buried in and continue to work for the sheriff's office is appalling to me. I have not been able to fully grieve my husband's death because of this. To say that Ms. Holmes' actions impacted me is an understatement. Her actions that day impacted everyone who knew and loved Wyatt. And all of us now have to try and figure out how to live without him. be interested in hearing from counsel. May I issue that invitation beginning with the state to make its uh, sentencing comments or recommendations. We'll turn to the defense as is customary if there's any uh, follow-up or rebuttal, I'll invite that from the state and then Ms. Hall if you would 
interested, I'll give you an opportunity to speak as well. Thank you, Council Mr. Neal. So uh, last week, I uh, was able to uh, have the oath of office administered and a, uh, an opportunity to speak on behalf of the, of the people brings a smile to my face. Um, today I need to speak to the people of Bonneville County and I need to explain how we got here. Um, I was speaking with a deputy and just asking about a pers his personal opinion and you know what his feeling for the, the deputies that work for the sheriff's office and how they felt this case this case should be resolved and um, he made the statement that if this was resolved at less than a felony uh, that the general feel would be we, we, we let them down and that we didn't fight for them. I, um, it, it weighs heavy on me that the family of uh, Deputy Mazur uh, feel that way as well. And uh, up until Tuesday night, um, I had every intention, uh, despite uh, receiving information very late uh, in the case, not, not late as to when I assumed office, um, that we were going to do everything we needed to do to be prepared for trial on Monday. Uh, part of that was to review thousands of pages of documents and uh, there were just dozens and dozens of hours of interviews and audio and video and so we began that process about two weeks ago of trying to get through that information and to understand it. Uh, one thing that I received was a the, uh, the decision by this court which I think accurately reflects the state of the law that for the remaining charge of aggravated assault that the question of whether mental uh, health issues or her mental condition uh, affected her ability to voluntarily or involuntarily do uh, the actions that we were able to clearly see on, on video uh, could be proven that uh, they did not, uh, that she could or could not uh, formulate the specific intent to uh, commit the crime of aggravated assault. Uh, that's a technical term, a legal technical term, specific intent, but it is an element of the crime that we would be required to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. The uh, defense provided an expert witness. I reviewed that uh, opinion. It was not persuasive in my view. Uh, it seemed to be very uh, slanted towards a certain uh, opinion which was advantageous to the defendant. Um, I, I felt that it was uh, in many ways uh, had no problem reaching certainty even about the unknowable. So we proceeded forward. On Tuesday night, I then reviewed a, uh, a rather innocuous document that had uh, 200 pages of, of medical records. And at that point, then it became clear that there was a consensus of multiple uh, psychiatrists and other medical uh, mental health professionals as to uh, Ms. Holmes uh, mental health 
uh, issues and disorders. The conclusion that was consistent was that although drug use had likely led um, to these uh, mental health uh, disorders, that they had become independent and frankly, uh, to a certain extent, uncontrollable. Uh, but there was also a consensus that drug use and, uh, was something that exacerbated and made them worse. I did also review um, some documents that indicated that there was drug use and that some of that drug use was involuntary um, and unknown to the defendant. Um, which also can negate specific intent. Uh, typically, when it comes to a question like uh, whether mental health, what, an uncontrollable me mental health condition was uh, negated specific intent, that would be something that I believe that would be left to the jury to decide based on expert testimony. However, the sheer volume and consistency behind this clear and convincing evidence uh, concerning severe mental health issues um, led me to conclude that as the prosecuting attorney um, and in uh, compliance with my oath that the rare circumstance where uh, the conclusion is that no rational juror could find that we had met our burden beyond a reasonable doubt uh, applied in this case. I, I wanted to be clear that the decision to reduce the felony charge had nothing to do with compassion, it had nothing to do with balancing mercy and justice, I am not giving uh, this defendant the benefit of the doubt because I want to. It is only because I believe in my heart I am compelled by the law to do so. This family knows a lot about oaths. They've all taken them at one point or another in the military, um, Wyatt, Wyatt's mother was a deputy sheriff herself. Wyatt himself took the oath in the military and as a deputy sheriff. Words like honor, commitment to duty, integrity, they mean something to this family. And they must mean something in this court. And that is why I feel that the outcome is necessary. Um, I do absolutely believe that Ms. Holmes' actions contributed significantly to the outcome, which was the death of uh, Deputy Sheriff Wyatt Mazur. Uh, she is not escaping accountability entirely. These two charges do reflect what, what she did. They do not carry the same specific intent requirement. That is why I believe they're appropriate and we can move forward on them. And um, I believe that the time that has been served is, is closer to what we would see in an aggravated assault charge if it had been, um, if it had been, there had been a conviction uh, for aggravated assault. Um, it is an imperfect result. It's not satisfactory and if, if it was not, I believe, required, then perhaps it would have been easier for me simply to uh, pass that decision on to the jury so that they could be accountable for it. But it falls upon me. 
I am also now uh, responsible for the stewardship of this office. And during the course of this prosecution, we, be able, we fell below standard. And I apologize to Paige and Sandy and Chris for that. Today is the uh, 17th anniversary of the death of my best friend. But I was able to deal with that grief in a linear way. I do not have the capacity to fully understand what this family is going through. Because each time we have this motion, or we have a pleading, or we have some decision, or a hearing, they are, they are constantly having this, this just reopen. I, I, I do not believe in closure, but I think the time now to, to at least settle this part is, is upon us. I believe that the actions of the deputies saved Jenna Holmes' life. It came at an incredible, unimaginable price. I hope Miss Holm earns it. There is a child that is growing up without her father. I want to believe that Miss Holm was saved that night by the actions of those brave young men for a purpose that some child may benefit from her or that she can do some good, that she can help someone. But I beg, I beg you, you must stop using drugs. They affect your mental health and people are in danger when that happens. When you think of suicide or you think of using drugs, instead think of the price that was paid so that you can do good and that you can help someone who needs it in your life, some loved one. I have to believe that there was a reason that you survived. You have to believe that too. I uh, ask that the court impose the six months on the uh, exhibition, the brandishing, which is, I think, what most people would, would call it, and one year for the resisting uh, and arrest and obstructing the officers. And I would ask that that run concurrent. It is my understanding, however, that she has served 19 months, and so under the law, she's allowed credit for that time, and that would constitute satisfaction of that, that sentence. Um, as to uh, anything else on the, the sentence, I, uh, I believe that the fines and court costs that are common here um, you know, because she has fulfilled the, the entire amount of the, the jail sentence, that those would most likely be uh, something that would have to be enforced in a different way, because I don't believe under the law that probation would be allowed on these two charges. Um, when these choices come up, in the future for Miss Holm. I just think that what must come forward and foremost 
is the price that has been paid. We, we can't see the invisible mental health issues. We do know that there is an addiction issue. If those aren't addressed, bad things are going to happen. And that unimaginable price that has been paid will be for naught. Make better choices because you owe a debt. Defense will be you, Mr. Wixon. Yes, sir. Uh, you may present your statement. Judge. Judge Edmont, I'm not surprised that this has been such a heavy hearing. The only word that he would, would come close to describe it for me is tragic. It's a tragedy. I'm sorry, Your Honor. And I don't want to take away from any of the, the feelings or the experience or any of the statements that have been made by the victims today. I think that they're entitled to feel the way that they feel and have the viewpoints that they do. And I don't want any of my arguments to detract from that. Um, there's been much spoken about the law already. And as harsh as it may be in this circumstance, the reality of the law um, that this court has looked at and found that it's been developed over centuries, centuries. How that, as some of these rulings you've made were, were decided on this years ago. And they're consistent with those laws that we've honored in the United States. And when you look at those laws and you apply those laws to the facts and the conduct, there's no criminal responsibility for the, the aggravated assault, for the manslaughter, or any of the other felony charges. It just doesn't exist. What our law does allow for, um, there's an Idaho statute in place, there's a jury instruction in place, there's case law um, for an accident or misfortune. There simply are circumstances that occur that are tragic and they're horrible and they're awful. And our law recognizes that there are times when the only thing we can do is assign it to be an accident or a misfortune. And Your Honor, I think that that is hard in a lot of circumstances. I think it certainly is something that's extremely hard here for this, this victim and their family. But I would just, I would state that I don't want to turn this into any kind of an argument about who is or isn't liable, civilly, criminally, morally, or any way. The only thing I, I came here today, and I probably spoke more than I intended to already, the only thing that I come here today to do is to remind the court of some of the facts. I know that, um, I know that Mr. Neal has worked very hard. And, and many other members of his office and he's taken office have worked hard on this case and taken a close look. And there have been discussions had. Mr. Crane and I have lived with this case for almost two years, like this was its existence. We've worked the case all the way through. We've been to the hearings, we've read the reports, we've seen the expert reports, the police reports, the medical records, all of that history. And all that was taken into consideration when this agreement came together. I think that there are a lot of facts that have yet been unspoken. Again, I don't want to, to distract from the feelings that have been expressed by the family. I think, though, this is just a sad situation, and it's important to point out for your honor. We would urge the court to follow the recommendation. Um, your honor, I think that when you hear about drug use or mental health, and you hear perspectives that hasn't been treated, or that one causes the other or doesn't, or disagreement, which is fair to have with expert opinions. I think you need to, to, to step back on two things. One, the expert opinion that you did look at was from an expert that's very well known to this court. Um, this expert has, has lived in Idaho Falls for decades, has been involved in mental health, is a PhD psychologist, regularly testifies before the court on these kinds of issues. Very well qualified, and frankly, from what I can see, is always very well respected by the courts and, and, and the the legal community. His opinion is different than Mr. Neal's, which Mr. Neal's entitled to, but that expert went back and looked, as I recall, at six or seven years worth of mental health and medical records for this home. And 
the videos in this case and the police reports and consider all of those things. That expert often interviews people um, for criminal competency and finds them competent. He doesn't let them in and out be a scapegoat to the conduct. I just throw that out there, you are, because the reality is that expert told you in the report that you're familiar with the state that Jenna's behavior was a result of what's called limbic conduct. Um, because of the circumstances, because of PTSD issues that she's had since she was a child that have never ever been treated during her interactions with our legal system. Though they've been noted by mental health experts, they've never been treated with the PTSD. We don't know what causes, what are strong use that causes the mental health or mental health that it turns to self medication. We don't know the answer for anybody, let alone Jenna. But that limbic reaction from, from the circumstances of that night led her with the unconscious ability to engage in action. She was not conscious of what she was doing. Your Honor, and if you set that aside, you just put the, if you assume the worst, if you assume that she was perfectly mentally healthy and that she was completely voluntarily intoxicated, but set those aside and look at the facts I'm now about to talk about, you still have to come to the same conclusion and the same mitigation that we think applies to this woman. It's irrefutable, actually, that night she was in a car accident. She pulled her car. It was 5 o'clock in the morning on a country road, a lone woman on a dark highway. It's just that simple. And it's a remote area. I'm having area. difficulty hearing it. Sir, if it's comfortable to sit so you're into the microphone, I'm okay with that. I might stand if that's okay, but I'll make a better effort. Your Honor. That's better. The reality is she was out miles from town. Law enforcement, from the police reports, from the materials for this case, through testimony, they described it out there as dark. One of them said it was dark, dark, dark. One said it was dark as hell. Another bystander said it was a special kind of black. You couldn't see out there. She's out there. She's alone. She rolls her car. With respect to some of the interview of Deputy Botcher, it was conceded that in the heat of the stress of all these events, he experienced tunnel vision. He became particularly focused because of the stress of all the things that were going on. I don't think it's any leap for your honor to ascribe that to Jenna when she's a lone woman on a dark highway who just rolled her car. There's no cell service. The other, that same bystander who was very involved in this case testified, it's spotty. You can't get calls out there easily, where she was. It's a scary area. The bystander who called it in and who participated in the events testified he wouldn't get out of his truck because of the nature of the area that they were in. Deputy Botcher, who initially responded, testified that he had been to that very area just hours before with a call about a homeless person who was out there. There are vagrants out there. It's not the safest place for a lone woman on a dark highway. So you take aside, you set aside all the mental health, you set aside any substance abuse. And this woman who'd gone through this, the shock and the trauma of an accident, Deputy Botcher testified that in his experience, it's not uncommon for anybody to be in a car accident to go through some shock and some trauma from it. She gets out of the car, she starts walking down the road, and what does she have with her to keep herself safe? The machete. She walks down the road and the bystander sees her, law enforcement approaches. I'm not making any statements today to denigrate law enforcement, but these are the facts. When they came, they didn't use their emergency lights. They just used bright, shiny lights in her direction. So when she saw law enforcement, she didn't see them as law enforcement. She saw a vehicle with bright, white, glaring lights. When, they, when Deputy Botcher gets out of the car, there's nothing that illuminates his uniform. He doesn't have a flashlight. And then there's bystanders in a, what was testified to as a loud, noisy diesel truck. And, and, and Officer Botcher, Deputy Botcher said it was very windy. He had to yell because of the wind, hoping that people could hear it as he followed Jenna along the roadway. Deputy Botcher trying to manage the situation, trying to get the help of the bystander. 
is giving confusing directions during the several minutes that this, this incident happened. Go forward, stop, please keep going, sir. Please stop, Jenna, and back and forth. And it's not clear what his, who his commands are directed to. It just simply is, if you can't watch this video and believe that it was clear, you factor that in. Jenna is confronted by some, someone who pulls up in a car with bright lights who immediately starts walking from her. She's described by them as, he run, she runs away. That's the first thing she does when she sees. Doesn't know it's a cop, starts running down the road. And then all of a sudden, the bystander pulls up in front of her, paces her down the road, has a noisy diesel truck, has a dog in the back, threatens to sick his dog on her. And then in this process, in just a matter of moments, there are two completely unrelated bystanders driving down the road right before Deputy Mazur approaches. Um, one of them slows down, but then drives way too fast and speeds by. The other one comes to a complete stop. You can watch the video right next to Jenna. So she's being confronted by someone that she can't see as a law enforcement officer. She has this guy up here right in front of her who keeps pacing in front of her, who's threatening to sick his dog on her. And then these two complete strangers drive the other direction, one stopping and, and nearly making contact with her. She has no idea who they are. And then the next thing, we have these uh, glaring over uh, sea lights, no emergency lights that are coming in from the major speed. And again, I'm not denigrating law enforcement, but the reality is emergency lights were not used. Those things used to identify a law enforcement officer readily were present. Law enforcement who was there were wearing dark navy uniforms that probably don't, aren't very readily seeable in the dark. Your Honor, I just ask you to consider and looking at all of these factors and hoping that you'll adopt, um, it, it's a, a binding agreement, but that you'll see this mitigation, that Jenna wasn't reacting much differently than I think a lot of women would. If my wife had been on the highway and she'd rolled her car and she was by herself and didn't have cell service and there were vagrants and homeless people walking around and she was in shock and trauma, I would, I would gladly put a machete in her hand so she didn't have to walk down the highway by herself. And I, I just urge the court to consider that. There's a lot of factors here. It's not just as simple as the result of the tragedy that happened. That's why our law is what it is. That's why we have an accident and misfortune. She didn't do anything really differently in terms of her cause, whether it was mental health, whether it was drug use, than a woman who, would have, who got a flat tire right there in that moment. Or that a woman who um, the car broke down or ran out of gas and finds herself suddenly out in the scary place by herself. There's a lot of factors here that we urge the board to consider um, in adopting what we've recommended as a binding agreement. And that's all that I have. Thank you, Council. Council Neal, any additional comments from the state? I really wish Council would have stopped when they were ahead. The description that was just given was insulting to an, and incredulous. The the depiction of what happened out there uh, is, is absolutely distorted. And the rollover crash that occurred was probably a result of the choices. And we have talked about that extensively. And to accept responsibility for those choices that led to that situation is what should happen here. I understand that council has been involved with this case for years. There is an investment that has gone into it by the public defenders, and they have put every ounce of their uh, ability and skill. But the police I clearly identified themselves. She was running away from a police officer that was no excuse for what was happening from any point beyond. The idea that there was dark and she couldn't uh, in some way identify the uniform is crazy. This was a situation where Jenna was being called by name by an officer that she had interacted with within days. He had clearly identified himself 
as a member of the sheriff's office. And if I had my wife or my uh, significant what other out there, I would expect her to accept the help of the law enforcement and not take a machete in a crazy, threatening way and run away from them. I just find that this is, uh, again, hurtful to people that have already had to deal with this for a very, very long time. It's disappointing. The only reason, again, the only reason for the outcome that we are, have agreed to was because the state cannot prove beyond a reasonable doubt what was causing that episode. But what she was doing was clearly irrational. And to suggest that somehow she was rationally reacting to the circumstances out there is just absolutely inaccurate. But nonetheless, I don't know why we're having this discussion given the state of the case. It's just absolutely hurtful and unnecessarily so. So, Your Honor, we, we aren't changing the recommendations at all, and I don't, I don't think the recommendations in any way can be. But responsibility, taking accountability, would go much further than to try to minimize or to, in some way, justify the absolute unjustifiable. This created a chaotic scene which incubated the urgency and the decision making that was split second. And any of those decisions could have resulted justifiably in her life being taken. That accident could have taken her life. And those were choices that she made. What the police did, the sheriff's office did, was heroic and it saved her and it's just disappointing that we're not hearing more about the uh, the responsibility and accountability of, of those decisions that were made we simply cannot discount the mental health issues but to say that this was in some way rational is just uh, I, I just do not know how that can be um, spoken with any bit, any uh, credibility. So we would ask that the court uh, follow the recommendations. Thank you, counsel. We've heard from you. Now, Ms. Holm, I invite you to share a statement if you're interested. You wish to do so? Yes. All right, you may, you may then. If you pull that microphone forward so you can be heard, thank you. I just want to apologize to the family, to the wife, to the mother, and the father, to the daughter. And I feel very bad um, from the bottom of my heart. I'm sorry. I I know what it's like to lose somebody recently, and it hurts. And uh, I just wish that I could take back everything from that night, and uh, I'm going to do better in life. So. Ms. Holm, are you fully satisfied with the representation of your counsel? And counsel, is there any legal reason why the court should not proceed in a sentence? I don't think so, Your Honor. All right, well, thank you. So, counsel and, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, particularly counsel, you understand that um, typically uh, when appearing before the district court, we take recommendations as I have just received from you, and then the court makes a number of uh, statements and pronounces a sentence. I evaluate the objectives of criminal punishment. I'm going to do that much in the same way that I would should this have been um, the aggravated assault. I, I do that because of listening to both the recommendations of the parties and those that are all here. It's clear to me that I think uh, it's important that the court make a few statements about this case and the court recognizes it has less discretion in the sentence uh, but I want to share a few thoughts because it's been this court that has presided over the number of hearings that have 
taken place. And to the extent that I can say anything that uh, might be helpful to those that are grieving the loss uh, related to this um, tragic circumstances of this case, I, I hope to do so. And I look to those that are here, the family of the, of the deceased, and I look to Ms. Holm as well as I make these statements. The first thing is the court's awareness that this case has been developing for many, many months. And I am certain that many do not understand why there was such a delay to bring this case to where we are today, which is resolution. A review of the record would reflect that there were decisions made by both parties that resulted in some of that delay. And those decisions are made by experienced attorneys reviewing facts and circumstances and certainly the law. And then there were circumstances beyond the tr control of the party that resulted in some of the delay, and that was the COVID protocols that we were under during the pandemic. One thing is certain for sure by this court, and that is that each of the parties litigated this case and came to the court likely a dozen times over issues to be resolved with legal analysis, briefing, and arguments and decisions to be made. And I know, because I observed it, that the parties have worked tirelessly and evaluated the facts from every possible perspective and angle, including right up to uh, yesterday, when, frankly, the court was surprised to hear that the parties were uh, in an agreement and asking this court to vacate the trial setting. And I respect counsel for the effort that has gone into that resolution. It does not mean that there is uh, grief associated with the tragic occurrences of, of this event. And I have seen that in the courtroom. I have felt it. it it's present today. And it is important to acknowledge because, as was said earlier, this is a moment where it, it will not restore the things that were lost. And in, from various individuals we've heard today suggesting that there is perhaps no real closure, at least this proceeding, I hope, gives an opportunity for all of those affected to at least close a chapter in all of this. In the description, it was the worst day of so very many people's lives. And, and that's apparent as we listen to one another today discuss how this has impacted uh, each of you. So in a typical sentence, the court looks at the mitigating facts of a case and the aggravating facts. The court exercises discretion. Counsel certainly knows that there are four objectives of criminal punishment. I'm going to state them, uh, even though, as I said, my discretion is limited on this resolution, but it's important to consider what are those objectives. Protection of society, deterrence to you and to others, rehabilitation, and punishment. And while they weren't framed in those objectives in argument, I think everyone understands that they're all principles that are relevant to today's resolution. And I know the parties have strived for that in this agreement. It's very clear to the court that in each of your analyses, uh, it really amounts to elements of offenses and counsel uses technical terms. There were uh, descriptions today and over the course of the legal proceedings that use terms such as proximate cause, legal cause, interve intervening causes and acts, 
And I think it's clear uh, that everyone agrees that this was an event that should not have happened, and it, and it did. And uh, we are here today to confront that and to, in your case and in the states, offer a resolution and for you to walk through those doors and accept it. My role in this case is to sentence you consistent with the amended charges, and I will do that, and I will do it in a way that is uh, the maximum. And as I stated earlier in the proceedings, it is up to and will be the six months for the exhibition of a deadly weapon and a one-year uh, sentence for the resisting and obstructing. Uh, it is still appropriate, even though there might be different methods of uh, accountability and collection to impose a fine. I will do that on each of the two misdemeanor offenses, the $500 and the $1,000. Uh, as requested, the court will run these two offenses concurrently, and under the law, you are entitled to that custody that you have um, experienced while this case has been pending. Uh, I will turn back to defense counsel with your familiarity of reimbursement for the services of the public defender on these types of matters in magistrate court. If you have any comments, Mr. Crane. Is the court asking what's commonly, I would, I would venture to say that if they do impose it, it, it's as slow as 50, as high as 100 to 150, usually in magistrate court. Okay. It's not a great amount. And it's, uh, I know these things are not lost on the parties in all respects with regards to the, the resolution that has been arrived at. I, as I said earlier, I know the parties have invested a significant amount of time of effort, and so there really is no amount, I think, that could be um, ordered to reimbursement. Um, and so I, I think the court understands that, the nature of the agreement and in, in, in the magistrate arena, um, there won't be that. That will be just simply the public defender's uh, budget and expense. Ms. Holm, do you have any questions regarding the sentence? Any from counsel? Uh, no. Court costs and written relief. Court costs are standard based upon uh, statute for these two offenses and Victims Relief Fund applies uh, in a different amount, I, to the, not to the felony, but the misdemeanor. Counsel, do you have an understanding? I usually just see the court costs. That's, I think, my familiarity with uh, the misdemeanors as well. Subject to those uh, pronouncements, any other questions? Uh, and Your Honor, I, I, I believe that the court has to declare uh, that the amount of times uh, that credited and so uh, I, it sounds like it, it, for a concurrent one year would be sufficient but uh, I, I don't know if the court was was misunderstanding our recommendation which was consecutive but you know, we did ask for consecutive I heard concurrent so let's talk about that uh, let me just confer with counsel I you may. Pre-judgment incarceration can't be ordered consecutive. You have to get concurrent credit for any pre-conviction time. And then if there's any time left over, the court can impose that consecutively. So that the court's discretion is limited there as well. Right. All right. Very and fine. I heard so, the word concurrent come. I, that was my note in your, in your argument. I apologize, Judge. I misspoke. But it, I understand. So it would be credit for one year. Anything further? No, Your Honor. Nothing right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, that will be all you may be. All right, please.